Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Morton. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the artist and studio manager here at Baltimore Clayworks. We are thrilled that you all have joined us. I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining from my office located on Piscataway and Susquehannock land, currently known as Baltimore, Maryland. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual artist talk given today by Tim Kowalsik. He is currently in the exhibition, Ceci ne pas de papier. This is not a paper. Tim Kowalsik lives in Minonk, Illinois, where his home studio is located. Tim received his BFA from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, and his MFA from Illinois State University, Illinois in Normal. He imitates garbage-like items that relate to his grandfather's garages, his father's work at a carton factory, and his time working in a warehouse. Tim is currently a full-time ceramic artist and a high school art teacher. He exhibits nationally and internationally in group two-person juried invitational and solo exhibitions. Tim's work has been featured on Colossal by Kate Caesar Potowski, Ripley's Believe It or Not, Twisted Sifter, Bored Panda, Home Crux by Monica Thicker. For more information about our artist talks, please visit, please visit our virtual library at baltimoreclayworks.org. I will now turn it over to Tim. Uh in school, they always ask you to make an artist statement and ask you to have an elevator speech. And with my personality and the way I make things, I hope it comes across correctly. But the easiest way to explain stuff to people is I make stuff out of stuff that looks like other stuff. And for the art people, it's kind of funny. And it, it usually quiets down the people that are not that interested in just trying to make small talk so because usually I'm like oh you know I work with clay and they're like oh what do you make and I feel like there's this big long pause and I'm like I make stuff that looks like cardboard and they're like oh <laughs> it's, a, it's a big long thing but uh, so I have this kind of tongue-in-cheek intro uh, so I was born and raised in Illinois. I've kind of lived in the three different regions. I grew up in um, kind of the northern part. I went to school in the southern part, and then I moved to central Illinois. And when I say Illinois, most people think of this, which is the Chicago skyline. But I also, I, I don't live there. I live in a suburb of a suburb of a suburb in a little town called Minunk, Illinois, with a population of 1,800 people. And I thought it was only fair if I show where everybody thinks I live, I should show where I actually live. And this is an aerial view of my town. I am that little green patch after the bend. And my house is right there. Um, so I live in a really tiny town that doesn't have any stoplights. We have like two major uh, pizza places, it's a pretty nice quiet town keeps me in the studio. So my family has a lot to do with my background here are my two grandfathers. Uh, the one on the left, he was kind of a jack of all trades, but mainly focused on cars. My grandfather on the on the right, you can see his turkey coop that he built out of things he had on hand. And by the, seeing these two images, you can see where my work stems from, right? When we had to go clean up their houses after they had passed away or take care of some of their estate stuff, we found lots of cigar boxes and baby food jars that were repurposed and lots of uh, makeshift items that most people I don't think endure all the time. So I got this insight into how their brains worked as well as knowing their personalities. I was lucky enough to know both of them while they were alive. My big brother, I call him my big brother because he's six years older than me, but he's shorter than I am. Uh, he is a graphic designer. And one of the reasons I started in the 3D world was because I couldn't beat him in two dimensional. So I decided to go three dimensional because right brothers have rivalries so i've been doing my best to be better than him um uh, oops i don't know how to go backwards okay this is a a nice photo it's one of those uh photos you take at like 
I don't know, it was probably in Colorado when we went on a vacation. Uh, my father is definitely a jack of all trades. He can read most books and do whatever it says. My mother was a stained glass artist. I'm the little kid with the weird look on his face with the white cowboy hat. Um, so my dad got out of the army and he, my grandfather, my brother briefly, and about three of my cousins work at the same box factory in my hometown of Morris, Illinois. This is a shot of while they were decommissioning that plant during my undergraduate career. They had started to decommission it because they had gotten bought out by a different company. But while I was going through undergraduate, I decided to do something different, which was work at a warehouse. And I moved around boxes all day. So this vernacular of cardboard boxes, of cartons, of the markings they had was very in my life, right? I remember when the Jordan Weedy box got made. I remember moving around boxes at the warehouse and being like, oh, that must have fallen off of like the third level because of the damage it had, or that one got poor, poked by a forklift. There was lots of visual icons that I use today in my work that came from my experience from my childhood and then coming into uh, putting myself through college or trying to put myself through college, I should say. I'm going to scroll down here. So sorry that we have to like go through some of this. I'll try to try to keep it brief. So we have questions and answers. Um, so when I was looking into work, I, you know, of course you look to your art historical references David Furman had come for a workshop and I asked him about making work and he kind of uh, said it was too difficult, which was kind of the impetus for me to push harder and be more aggressive about making trompe work. I also ran into uh, a conversation with Robert, Ro or Robert Rauschenberg's studio assistant uh, who is in DeKal or Decatur now Jim Schiedinger and he told me about the Robert Rauschenberg Tampa clay pieces so throughout my history right I'm looking at the art historical references and talking to people and trying to figure out about Trompe and make sure like I'm on the right path and I kind of go through some different things I was trying to do these paintings and using paint and form as a way to create narratives starting you know starting with just the cardboard issues or material and then kind of expanding you can see the sponges in the lower right the styrofoam uh, this is my first or second year in grad school and then i started talking about semiotics and i didn't know it I had a friend talk to me about semiotics and the different versions. So here we have three different matches that can all talk about different types uh, of matches and what they do. And then once they're paired with something, right, birthday candle, a light candle. And then my favorite, which I think says a lot about my personality, is my Roadrunner example of the stick of dynamite. And what that did was allowed me to start pairing trompe objects together to start creating narratives. So here we have intentional dementia on the left, right? Yeah. And Nessie on the right, which is just like a formal, you know, formal exploration of materials and items. I worked on a series for Muhammad Ali's How Great I Am speech. This was my exploration into the juxtaposition of objects and using that semiotic quality to really get down to the point. So here we have, I tussled with a whale. It's a little tiny mic stand with a little squeaky rubber uh, whale attached to it. Handcuff lightning. Right, these are all ceramic objects. 
These are all been fired in the kiln. There's no like, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to use paint or any other kind of materials. I'm strictly 100% fired ceramics. There's no, uh, as some people might say, cold glazes. Uh, they've all been through at least a cone 04. Uh, murdered a stone, injured a rock. And all of these things start to build uh, hospitalized brick, start to build towards this much larger vernacular because I think a lot of people kind of get stuck in working with one clay body or working with one method of building. And through this exploration of trying to do Muhammad Ali's sorry, Muhammad Ali's illustrations, I learned that I didn't have to stay with one clay body. I didn't have to stay with one building method. I will tell you that I don't throw a whole lot. I do more hand building than I do throwing. Um, contrary to popular belief, I do know how to throw. Um, but slip casting, hand building have been my main vehicles of creation. Oops. Oh, why is that not going? Okay. So when I talk about objects and materials that I use, I'm talking about uh, these, these really odd words that people sometimes take uh, negatively. I don't take them negatively, but I do make garbage. And once I learned that I made garbage, I kind of figured out how to amplify the cardboard and use all that past knowledge through grad school and post-grad school to get to the point where I'm working with clay, making trompe objects, and then to finish it off, I'm making garbage or trash. Um, we're going to skip over that, but uh, so here are some other items that I made. These wine skin are all ceramic. These are from sites. Well, not from sites. They're ceramic versions of things I found at graffiti sites. Academic paint palettes that I found while I was teaching at junior colleges throughout my stint. This is, <laughs> it's my, it's my making process. I'm not going to play it because it's loud and obnoxious. If you want to see it, it is on my Instagram. Um, but as you can see, once I dialed into that garbage factor, you can see the paint splatters and the, the wear and tear on the work. You can start to see some more of like the masking tape remnants and the, the uh, rubbed off coloring of, you know, the, what would normally be a solid color on a new pretty box. And I was much more concerned with making boxes and uh, mugs and functional wear that talked about the history of the object rather than I went to the store, combined these two objects together, and here they are. Uh, at one point, I was making bowls. The one in the upper left, you can see, is very clean, very articulate. And it's a good functional bowl, and it still has the mastery of the cardboard and the underglaze transfer, but the one in the lower right is much more organic, feels much more like a piece of cardboard that you might find out in a ditch after somebody had it like in their garage as a background for spray painting or something like that. Also recently started to explore and sent several propane jars to uh, Baltimore Clayworks. It started out as an exploration, I think, as a lot of people do, looking to the Grecian vases for ceramics. And it was a, the Grecian vases worked and they were beautiful and they were nice, but they were not me. And I think when I switched to the, to the propane jars, it felt much more relevant to my history, my upbringing, my location and talked more about me being me and had this uh, small sense of humor about it, right? Because who has a propane jar, right? A propane tank as a, as a vase, let alone a cardboard propane jar, which is 
you know, kind of still makes me chuckle there, you know, every time I move them around or I send them out, I get excited because they're wonderfully absurd objects. I also started thinking more about uh, functionality. So the spray cans on the right, the little nozzles come out of them. Uh, so they're actually decanters. They have a little rattle uh, widget inside. So it actually rattles like it were an empty can. The martini cup, as it were, on the left is something that I thought about when my, you know, as if I were to go in my grandfather's garage and ask him to, as if I would ask to pour him a martini, but like, Grandpa, do you want a martini? And him shuffling around trying to figure out the right collection of objects to create this um, wonderfully absurd cup that resembles what we think of when we think of martini cups. And then this is my last image, uh, of course, the iconic fragile work. And then the playing with masking tapes, playing with a little bit more of a contemporary color palette, playing with a little bit more of the idea of trying to construct cardboard into a functional, functional item. And when I say that, I usually think of my my functional wares is sculptures that just happen to function. I try to think of them compositionally and formally first as sculptures, and then I apply certain things that make them function.